So. All right, thanks, Ping. <laughs> so yeah, Ping, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name's Derek, and my last name's Simonson, and um, I teach in fine arts uh, in uh, my first year of uh, my tenure track uh, probationary period. It sounds so wrong. <laughs> But like I've been bad or something, but um, no, I, I so far this is my second year at the falls. I was uh, um, annualized last year, and and it's been really great. I've taught at uh, some different colleges around the area, and by far this is the most amazing of them all. <clears throat> um, I I'm holding this brown bag today because I I received uh, some grants from the school and. And part of that uh, obligation, or part of that uh, stipend, is that you you kind of return with some points of interest or response to what you uh, sought the money out for. Um, I, and what I was uh, receiving the money for was basically travel expenses for professional um, uh, development. Uh, I'm an artist. I said it was in fine arts. Um, I, I, I do. Uh, quite a bit with my visual art, creative intelligence. I draw, I paint, I sometimes I make videos and little animations. I seem to always kind of process stuff creatively and, and a lot of times it's uh, due to my um, uh, uh, dyslexia, I, I, I turn things around and I, I, I run things in reverse and change the order all the time. So if I end up sounding like a record playing backwards, that's, that's why. Um, the, um, uh, the actual uh, stipend for the travel was for me to go and participate in uh, an exhibition that I was in um, and it's still going on at the Bellevue Art Museum. The, uh, the, the show is a survey of uh, Northwest artists who uh, work with wood and um, I, I've been drawing and painting on wood panels for the last uh, five years or so after I got out of graduate school. I was actually doing it at graduate school too, but um, in 2010 when I got out of graduate school, I, I started kind of exclusively working on the surface of wood. Um, and uh, in 2013, there was a call for Pacific Northwest artists who work with the medium of wood to submit a proposal unique to the biennial. And my proposal was accepted along with 39 other artists from British Columbia, Washington State, Idaho, and Oregon. Uh, it was the first year they included British Columbia in, in the show. And I think a couple of uh, artists end up, ended up coming down for this exhibition. So I went to the opening uh, courtesy of uh, the uh, foundation and um, uh, was very well received. It was uh, a great uh, kind of meet and greet session. I stayed for about four days and I went back to the museum every single day. I went back with my two-year-old daughter, I went back with my, my girlfriend, and I spent as much time as, there, as I could because, you know, I'm kind of decentralized over in Spokane and I wanted to make the most out of it. Um, so the curator Stefano, uh, or his, he would like you to call him Stefano, it's still hard for me to say that, but he, he's kind of funny about that. Uh, Stefano Catalini was the curator along with three other um, judges uh, from uh, all over the country. Um, the, the work that I created for the biennial was in response to, and, and I'm using the internet because I know it said slide presentation, but if you know, it came just for the slide presentation, I apologize, but I, I've dealt with technology enough to know that I was started building the slides rec uh, uh, presentation. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I have all this stuff on my website and I, I run a blog with all the information I need to talk about. So I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between um, websites here and, and blogs. Uh, the work that I made for the biennial uh, was, uh, my proposal wasn't, to make work in response to the pho photographic history I have in my family that depicts early century everyday life in logging communities. Um, 
I, in 2010, was awarded a, a residency at a place called the James and Janie Washington Foundation in Seattle. And I spent a month there um, uh, basically going through and archiving all of these photographs as best as I could. And I gone through the collection probably about thoroughly about five times now. There's probably uh, 2,000 photographs. There's easily over a thousand postcards. Uh, and in addition to that, there's uh, um, articles, ephemera, uh, you name it, um, beyond that numbering in the hundreds. So it's, it's a very massive uh, piece of history. Um, so in 2010, uh, I was able to kind of like spend a month, go through all this. I invited the University of Washington's libraries, um, uh, special collections, I can't remember if she was like the coordinator or director, to come and see it. I had it kind of all laid out on this big table and because uh, eventually I'd like to donate all this stuff uh, um, to, to the right institution. And she was really, really uh, excited to, to, to see it all and, and um, uh, you know, maybe at some point when I'm kind of finished with all my research, the, the, the you will get it. Because my family, my, my grandfather uh, went to the University of Washington, he became electrical engineer. So there's kind of some uh, associations that tie into themselves. Um, okay, so I'm going to start kind of back at the beginning, and which is about the turn of the century, and um, fill in some blanks for you guys and give you some historical perspective. Uh, in 1906, I'm gonna move to the blog here. In 1906, uh, excuse me, 1903, my great grandfather, uh, Eric Andreas Pearson, who's pictured here in his wedding photograph in Sweden, immigrated from Sweden in 1903 to the United States and ended up in the Pacific Northwest down by Longmont, um, excuse me, Longview. Um, he was basically integrated into the logging industry and began working for railroad uh, companies um, as uh, a worker and eventually became superintendent of a company called the Wisconsin Lumber and Timber Company. Um, this is his photograph uh, uh, with his first bride um, Christina Odalina, who died just shortly after the birth of their first child, which uh, who was named Holger, uh, Eric Holger Pearson. And um, uh, she was, I think, uh, in her uh, late 20s, um, and just months after his birth, she passed away, and I'm still trying to figure out why. Um, currently, thanks to a, a campus faculty here, Asa, um, What's your last name? Bradley. Bradley. Uh, thanks to Asa Bradley, hopefully I'll find out more about this. Uh, she's interpreting a lot of postcard correspondence right now for me, and I can't thank her, for her enough. She's, she's absolutely amazing. Um, she, she just emailed me today and said she can't come, but she's been working on, on the pictures, or excuse me, the postcards. So this was their firstborn child. Um, this is uh, my uh, grandfather, which would be my mom's father, who's in the back there. This is, I think, one of the first photographs that I have of his uh, childhood. There's, there's a few more, and I haven't figured out if it's him or not. Um, uh, this, is, this is another photograph of uh, my great-grandfather, and um, it's either a, a cousin or a friend. I'm not sure if it's uh, his brother. He had two other brothers, and I'm still trying to identify those two. This is my last post on the blog. Um, the, the, the research I'm doing right now is taking me all over the place. Uh, with this blog, I started um, very early, uh, and then I, I kind of uh, traced back to um, some uh, areas uh, of uh, some of the areas of time before uh, the immigration, um, before the actual uh, time in which my great grandfather came out uh, to the to the United States, um, uh, I, I opened the blog up with a post that uh, basically introduced the idea behind it. 
um, telling uh, the viewer or the reader exactly kind of what my intentions were. Um, I've always felt a very strong bond with the Pacific Northwest. It's always been kind of like this biological connection. Um, I grew up on the west side as well as the east side uh, and spent a lot of time in the mountains and the Cascades. Uh, I, I've uh, uh, done my own um, fair share of kind of explorations and uh, outdoor activities in the Olympic Mountains, the, uh, the volcanoes there, up and down the, uh, the Cascades and, and uh, in those areas. Um, so that, that kind of that bond has, I think, drawn me to all this and having all this history now in my possession has really kind of impelled me to uh, pr preserve it and find out more about it. This is a photograph of uh, my grandfather who was pictured uh, standing on the chair as a boy uh, in that last uh, image. He's uh, here with his rifle um, with uh, his schoolmates, I presume on the 4th of July, posing um, outside Oak Point. He was probably about 10 years old, maybe 12 years old here, and had been in the United States maybe about a year. Um, as the blog progresses, uh, it goes through kind of an extended biography and, and starts uh, creating a narrative. Um, these postcards are uh, some of the postcards early on when Eric Andreas was coming across the United States and, and, and posting back to his family in Sweden and telling them um, how well he was doing uh, and what the, the territory and the experiences he was having were like. Um, as, he, as he came through and landed in the Pacific Northwest, the culture changed, obviously. Uh, before um, uh, his uh, arrival, he was de definitely accustomed to a whole uh, a new uh, or a whole kind of uh, set of cultural norms that were very much broken down when he got here. So uh, I remember reading at some point that um, when uh, the Swedes were arriving, they were dressed very differently. Um, the, the logging uh, communities were wearing, you know, like Filson wear and, and, and woolies and and rugged outfits, and they came dressed a, a lot of times in velvet and lace. So there was this very kind of like uh, interesting um, uh, situation uh, with the dress uh, when they arrived. Um, the blog continues to talk about um, what it's what it was like, kind of residing uh, in in the the presence of these massive timbers. You saw on that last slide uh, a family standing at the base of a Douglas fir tree that said 13 feet in diameter. That was the Baldridge family. Um, I'm finding a lot uh, more about the families that uh, were working at that time period um, for the Wisconsin Lumber and Timber Company. Um, most of them uh, that I have photographed here were Swedish. People were coming from Sweden establishing their lives and then sending back letters saying send so and so and so and so and those families would come. I have pictures that I found uh, in the collection from going through it that uh, show certain uh, uh, individuals in photographs in Sweden and the same individuals in photographs in the United States but before and after the arrival of my family. So there was kind of like this influx uh, in the first uh, two decades of the 20th century. These are photographs of children. Um, you can see the logs in the background. This was probably in the 1910s. I did a, a blog post that was called um, uh, Community Members or Community at Large, rather. Uh, I, some of the names were on the back of the postcards and some of them uh, were blank. I started documenting the, the ones that were um, uh, the individuals that were named, and I found online a um, database for Cowlitz County, which was the county that this was um, taking place in. Uh, some uh, uh, archivist uh, in Seattle has started, and there's census um, records, and um, it's basically a, a, an online digital database to catalog everything that anybody can offer uh, up in 
terms of who was living in Cowitz County at what time. So there's all these little threads kind of starting to be stitched together. I was really happy to find this because I, I have a lot to offer this site. Um, and the, the manager of the site was really excited to hear from me. Um, because if you look through the census records, they have them kind of plotted out in columns and rows. You can add, oh, the Bennett family, which is uh, this post, um, Mrs. Bennett and daughter Evelyn. I just find them in the, in the uh, census records, and then I can put my link to this post and anybody associated with the Bennett family who wants to know more about their history, if this is actually their family, can go and kind of find out more about it. So I've been, I've been dipped into this, this uh, kind of like genre of genealogy by almost accident. Um, and it's really interesting to learn about it. Um, these uh, individuals here, these three young children, were uh, friends from uh, the uh, county that my family was uh, from in Sweden, which is called Yampland. Um, these uh, uh, three kids uh, are again and again seen in photographs in the logging communities. They came after uh, the arrival of my great-grandfather, so they came probably around 1906. There was a handwritten uh, note on the back. You can see it here. It's in, in English, and I translate it here. Uh, and it's the older of the three at the bottom there talking to my grandfather and telling him that they went to the um, uh, park outside of Portland, which was pretty uh, famous for its time, the Oaks Amusement Park, and she was talking about, I thought this was kind of funny, the kind of light she refers to, um, and I'm guessing th th she's talking about the photograph and there was this flash bulb that I'm sure that went off and she was really intrigued by that, but the, the stories that I I'm able to kind of create narratives with are, are, are fascinating. This was a whole uh, bunch of pictures without names. Some of these people, uh, I, I have yet to find out who they are, um, but uh, if you're interested in going to the site, and just for the pure pleasure of kind of looking through old photographs, um, you, can, you can access these pictures there. The website, by, by, uh, um, by the way, is vintage-alpine.com, vintage-alpine.com. Um, as I started uh, working more and more on posting, uh, uh, I, I found uh, other photographs that uh, were of families. This was um, Evelyn. Uh, her name was Evelyn, I think, Bennett. Excuse me, I, I might be wrong. That's, uh, yeah, that's the Bergstroms. And that little girl was um, the daughter of this woman here. And I assume these two were married. This is Mrs. Bergstrom, and that's her daughter, Ellen. Um, <laughs> I love how dressed up they would get. These pictures that they were taking with these kind of elaborate backgrounds came around um, in the, uh, I think just after the turn of the century, and I think they were called cabinet cards. I'm gonna go back to original page here, if I can get the page to load, and scroll down a bit. Okay, I say start right here. While uh, doing my research uh, with the, um, the photographs, particularly the ones that were of the logging camps, um, I knew about this database before uh, but was reintroduced to it um, when I was making these posts. Uh, the University of Washington Libraries has an online database uh, uh, called um, the University Libraries Digital Collections. This photograph was taken from that digital collection, was taken by uh, uh, one of a group of brothers that were at that period of time going around to different logging companies and just taking photographs. Um, and they were called the Kinsey Brothers. Um, the Kinsey Brothers, uh, I think there was maybe three, there might have been two, but there was at least two of them that were very active in traveling around that lower Columbia region, 
up into the, uh, the lower part of the Olympic Peninsula and in, on the other side uh, of the uh, border into Oregon um, by Astoria. And they were just basically documenting everything that was going on because these productions were massive in scale. These uh, outfits were using steam locomotive and steam powered engines to, to what would be called yard the lumber onto um, these flatbed railroad trucks and then put them uh, into the Columbia and ship them to mill. Uh, the interesting thing when I found this photograph was that I remembered in the, uh, my own collection or my family's own collection that there was a similar photograph of these little one-man shacks. Um, on the back of this card, uh, it said that uh, these were made so that they could be picked up and moved on locomotive to the next location easily, so that's why they're kind of up on risers. But this photograph from Kinsey, and it looks like it was taken by Clark Kinsey, is the same small community as the photograph that I have from the family. And I realized this uh, because of the structural quality of the, the, the dwellings and also because of this little, what looks like kind of a superintendent's office. This is taken at a different angle, but this is the same superintendent's office. The format of the, uh, the layout of the, the buildings is, I think, a little different. This is taken later on. This uh, is taken pretty much, I'm sure, at least a summer or a, a couple of seasons after it was installed. That building right there that I'm pointing at is this building right here. We can see other kind of uh, sig uh, uh, implications here. This is that water tower. Here's that water tower. So when I started to figure this out, I was like, oh, wow, well, maybe um, these Kinsey brothers and my great grandfather who was taking these photographs were actually in contact with each other. The next uh, discovery I had um, was, I think I'm going the wrong way, I apologize. Yeah, this was the net, this was actually the first discovery I had. The, the last one was the, the second one, but this one even more profound to me. This was actually the, uh, the, the photograph that I made the connection with. This is a Kinsey brother photograph and um, uh, taken from a vantage point there, very similar to this one, uh, knowing that they were going out and clearing the forest out. These were two photos were probably taken within days of each other. Uh, so interesting course uh, uh, connections there with um, what was happening in terms of documentation and what was going on there with the industry and the happenstance that I could have uh, made that uh, connection with the University of Libraries online database and, and my own collection I think is really, really wonderful. Um, okay, so uh, after I got my, um, I'm gonna kind of backtrack here a little bit uh, with um, um, from where I started um, or with what I started with uh, and talk about my proposal. My proposal was to make work in response to these photographs that I've been um, going through uh, for the last few years and make some drawings um, in the technique that I was exploring uh, uh, that responded to the uh, amount of imagery that I was seeing. Um, what was taking place in those images? There was a lot of destruction. It was kind of an environmental uh, uh, holocaust. It was just an ancient forest to the uh, to put it simply, being destroyed thousands and thousands of years of ecological growth and, and uh, interdependency was being obliterated, just absolutely destroyed and desecrated. Um, I had that kind of going through my head. I had uh, the, uh, the kind of pride that you have with your own family and, and where they're from and where they came from and what they did going through my head as well. Um, and when I started making the work, I, I wanted to bring those two worlds together, like the, the kind of like um, the, that, that proudness that comes from being from a, a family that has such deep roots in the, the Pacific Northwest and that, that, uh, that stance I take is, is, you know, I call it quasi-environmentalism. I, I try to be uh, as, as mindful and as conscious as I can. Uh, I ride my bike to work. I try to, you know, uh, 
put less of a footprint on the environment as possible. So those, those two worlds almost collided in these drawings. The first piece I made was, was this piece here. This is actually a, a photograph I worked, the photograph I worked from was a picture of my great grandfather, Eric Andreas, the same individual that came uh, from Sweden in 1903. And I crossed section, I, I basically cut his face into thirds and to reveal that the inside of his body was made of wood. Um, you can kind of see the concentric circles uh, here and here. And um, at some point I decided to give him, instead of a second ear, a, a tree limb. This is a detail. The technique I'm using is like you would see in a printmaking process called dry point. The surface of the wood has been treated with a polyurethane. These are actually old chunks of bowling alley. So I reclaimed an old chunk of a bowling alley and I was making these drawings uh, on, on the actual surface. Uh, the, the surface is scratched into, I usually use an X-Acto knife. I cut into the surface and then I wipe a mixture of oil, uh, excuse me, vegetable oil and graphite powder into those incised lines. And since it's treated, since it's polyurethane uh, uh, on the surface, all the other uh, ink, I'll call it, is wiped away and it illuminates this very uh, intense graphic line. And you can scratch, you can cut, you can kind of even steal wool to rough up the, uh, uh, the surface and rub that ink in it. And, and you, when you wipe away the excess, you get this really intense um, high contrast with the, the quality of the dark ink in the wood. Um, this was the first drawing I made. This kind of was a platform for the rest of the work. I started thinking about all the relationships we have with trees. And there was, like, if you put your mind to it, a lot of them. Um, and that happens, I think, with most things. But in particular, I, I was that summer, this would have been last summer, doing a lot of hiking, as I normally do. And I started to notice that physically, formally, we share a lot with trees as well. Um, and I started exploring that in my sketchbooks and, and looking around in nature and finding these, these, uh, uh, this, these situations where we share these formal relationships. And that led me to uh, a few more, excuse me, getting out of order here, uh, associations that I brought into the work. Um, in this piece, uh, I, I was actually, ironically, down in the area where these logging photographs were, uh, were shot to begin with, um, hiking by Mount Adams. And I noticed that the base of trees, if they had the right angle, look a lot like our ankles. Um, so I started making these drawings and, and showing uh, that, that, you know, uh, if we make some toes popping out of the ground um, and, and, and cut the uh, <laughs> tree off uh, like you would if you were logging, it, it is a lot like what we look like. Um, uh, we've referred to our, ourselves as having limbs. Um, we, we, we consider ourselves to have roots where we live. Um, we, there's a, a lot of analogies that I was uh, uh, working with at that point that kind of uh, uh, propelled me through this, this process of making that connection. Um, this particular drawing, instead of connecting with the past, is connecting with modernity. There's a fire pit and there's contemporary graffiti um, on the log. So that's basically contextualizing this is as in the present. Um, I'm going to come back out to my website. This is my website, by the way. It's antipainter.com. Um, so that work uh, took me, uh, those last two drawings took me into the early part of the summer. I started to work with a, a photograph, um, and I'm going to just go back and see if I can find that photograph. Probably be important. There it is. This is the photograph I chose to make um, the uh, larger piece uh, for the for the biennial that you just saw on my website. Um, I'm sorry for it. it's kind of small, but you can see the the train tracks if you look coming through here. There's another set of train tracks that go through here. There's a mill back in the background. You can kind of see off to the distance 
uh, it's fairly flat. They're probably uh, down uh, around the uh, um, uh, area of Longmont there, just north of it. You've got clothes hanging. Um, I zoomed in, I scanned this image in at like 2400 or 4600 DPI. It was ridiculous. And I was able to zoom in on the computer and, and magnify this. I didn't find one single person in this photo. It was in, taken in midday. Nobody was in this photo. I couldn't find a single person, which was really weird to me because it's such an active time of day and everybody, I'm sure, has something to do. I'm sure there was workers out in the field and you know people in town tending to things as well, but I couldn't find one person. So that, that thought kind of stuck with me for a while. Why wasn't there anybody there? Um, and I thought at one point, this is after I started the drawing, I thought at some point, well, maybe there was some kind of like, you know, uh, catastrophe or something like that taking place and everybody fled the town. So that led me to depict this fire happening in the background or in the foreground. Um, that was made up um, in, the, in the actual piece that I did for the biennial. Um, I started working the drawing down uh, in this area. And this is, to give you a, a sense of scale, this, this is probably, well, it's about as wide as a bowling alley and about, about this big, or, uh, five and a half feet or so wide. Um, the, um, so the drawing took quite a bit of time. But as I got up and through here, that, that thought uh, that was sticking with me, why aren't there any people in this photograph, it, it led to me to, to kind of make some improvisations and uh, fictionalize this a little bit. I added a fire coming out of the mill, which happened quite a bit back in those days anyway. Those mill fires were pretty common. Um, but that also became kind of a, a very symbolic thing as uh, you could relate it to the the overall just kind of desecration of what was going on. It was kind of like we were wiping everything out. Um, at some point uh, in drawing this, I, I thought it would be nice to have what I would consider my grandfather standing and looking out at all this taking place. He ended up being uh, uh, a mountaineer, which I hope I'll have time to get to, and an environmentalist along with his wife. She was an ecologist and they became part of the Seattle Mountaineers. They were involved with the Audubon Society. Uh, it was pretty much their whole life was dedicated to, to preservation and um, uh, designating, they were involved with the North Cascades uh, National Park uh, uh, designation and, and all uh, the arboretums around Seattle. So they were staunch environmentalists, conservationists. He grew up in these areas where that was pretty much on the opposite, he grew up on the opposite of the spectrum, seeing all this destruction. So um, the fact that he's standing here, and you can hopefully see it on that log, he's, he, the scale is a little bit out of whack, but I, I thought playing with scale was appropriate since uh, the, the logs and, and what we were kind of uh, confronted with back in those days was quite large. So he, he appears larger than the tree. He's kind of looking out at all this, uh, almost a relaxed and, and, and at peace with it. The mountain in the background, um, they were around the area of Mount St. Helens, is, is a stylized version of Mount St. Helens before it blew. And this is a detail of the drawing. <clears throat> so you can see the wood grain showing through because of the, the lack of finish. And all these little scratch marks are done with the razor blade. Um, this is a detail of the, uh, the billowing smoke coming out and you can kind of see little uh, areas of pinned up laundry and, and things like that. I have um, an installation shot from the museum. This is the show. It was on, it's on the second floor, it's still showing. Uh, my pieces were uh, in a really nice spot as soon as you got out of the elevators and uh, hung, I thought, in a very clever way. Um, so this might give you an idea of uh, the size. This is a, another installation shot. You can kind of see how the, uh, the surface is, is shiny. Go back to drawings. One of the 
It was actually the first piece I started, but it was the last piece I finished. This piece right here is um, kind of grotesque. It actually freaked some people out. Got some emails that said that the work was disturbing, and, and, and I thought, well, you know, you're doing something right when you're getting people coming back at you with some negative feedback. Uh, someone told me that once, and it so far led to be true. Um, this is uh, uh, what the first drawing I started, the last drawing I finished. I was thumbing through some figure drawing books uh, for a figure drawing class I was teaching, and I saw this um, Rembrandt sketch. It must have been like a public hanging or something. He drew some uh, different studies of someone hanging in the courtyard, and I thought, well, that, that's a powerful image. You don't see that very often these days. How can I kind of bring that into the work? Um, and the fact that I was working in this uh, space where I was trying to create these connections between us and uh, the forest, I thought, you know, what we were really doing back then was really just killing ourselves. We were hacking away at our own. And, and this uh, particular piece is, is, is saying something like that. It's like, uh, the way I look at this piece is this, this person that could be anybody um, uh, has taken a, a walk up uh, for the last time can't see it really well, but there's a little bedroll right there. Um, and because of, I think mainly because of their just disgust, they decided to take their own life. And it might symbolize, you know, the literal, but I think it's more figurative and metaphorical um, and, and kind of a, a, a justification, a visual justification of what I was dealing with. Um, at the end of the summer, after doing all these drawings, I became very depressed <laughs> and I had to like fix it. Um, I, I don't know whether it was just the spot I was in mentally and psychologically was kind of toying with my own kind of feelings of what are right and wrong, uh, but uh, it took me really far down, further down than I've ever been before. Um, but I definitely would do it all again because I really liked the work that came out of it. So that piece right there, um, is, is this kind of like symbol. There's this, you can see this row or this crow or this raven here, excuse me, kind of pecking away at the foot of this person. There's actually like an eyeball hanging out. I'll spare you for the rest of the gruesome details. But <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, when it came time to title these pieces, I was totally left with, with nothing. Like I, I didn't know what, what to do. And I I, I think I came to the decision almost by chance, but it, it seemed so right when I started doing it. Um, there was one of these pieces, I was listening to a Rolling Stone song that said, you know, you know, we all need someone to bleed on. And that was when I was making this one. And I thought, well, what I wonder what other Rolling Stones lyrics could uh, I associate with these. Uh, I named this one, I watched in Glee's Your Kings and Queens Fought. Ten decades for the gods they made. I named this one, It's Hard to Tell You're Lonesome When All Your Love's in Vain. And I named this one, Send Me Dead Flowers on My Wedding and I Won't Forget to Put Roses on Your Grave. So those were uh, the titles. Um, and whoever made the, uh, the cards, the display cards for the show was probably like, what was this guy thinking? Mm -hmm. Usually the title's like this short. <laughs> Um, thing. So that was uh, basically a very short uh, run through of um, what I've been doing in terms of research, how it informs my, my drawings, where my drawings have taken me. Uh, they've taken me to uh, the exhibition at the Bellevue Art Museum um, and kind of where I'm headed now. Now, I don't know if I can stick with the uh, the logging theme for much longer. After uh, five or six pieces, it, it just turns into a cliche, and I don't want to rely on it to to be kind of like uh, you know to to ha to be making something that sells. Um, uh, so I, I I I'm not sure exactly where I'm headed now, but I'm still going through the collection, and I'm still finding amazing photographs. Um, what I haven't talked about yet, and I think I have about five minutes, is that right? Um, Maybe we can go to 12.45. Oh, okay. 
What I haven't talked about yet was that uh, environmentalist, uh, uh, conservationist, ecologist side of my family. I talked about uh, the, the beginning and when uh, my, it was my mom's side of the family showed up, um, but from there on out I haven't said much about. My great-grandfather, who became a superintendent of the uh, Wisconsin Lumber and Timber Company, uh, uh, his son, my, my grandfather, became a mountaineer. Um, and uh, like I said, went to the University of Washington to study electrical engineering, but on pretty much every weekend on, with all their free time. Uh, and once he had married uh, my grandmother, Mary Pearson, they would take off to all sorts of different places around the Northwest and camp and climb. <clears throat> they uh, uh, were very prolific with these activities. They were going up into the Mount Baker National Forest. They were going south uh, to the Mount St. Helens region, the Olympic Peninsula. And then my grandpa started to climb some of uh, the, the higher peaks like Mount Shooksen, Mount Daniels, uh, there's photographs from Rainier Baker and, and you name it. I've got a climbing log of his and it's just, uh, it's astounding how many peaks that guy was able to make it to the top to. Um, but this is a photograph he took. Uh, it was in 19, it was between 19 and 29, 1931. Um, I think it was probably more like 1930 when this was shot. This is in the Mount Baker National Forest. Apologize for my cursor leaving it out there. Um, they had this old Chevy that they'd take around and put their backpacks on and wherever gas could take them, they would explore. So this is my grandmother, Mary Pearson, here in this photograph posing for uh, uh, her husband, Hal Pearson. Um, I'm gonna go back out to the additions here. Excuse me, I'm gonna go to history real quick because it has a photo photograph of that young boy that I showed at the beginning of the lecture growing up. This is uh, uh, my grandfather, Hal Pearson, as he went by Hal, um, with his Graflex camera, which I still have, uh, standing and looking at the General Hazard Monument uh, just on the border of the Mount, Mount Rainier National Park in Western Washington. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure who took the photograph. It could have been his wife, Mary, my grandmother. Um, I, I don't know if they had, uh, uh, well, they didn't have remote controls back then, I knew that, but, and I'm pretty sure they didn't have the timed uh, shutter speed either, so it must have been her or a friend. Um, he took that Graflex camera everywhere. Uh, he took it up on Mount St. Helens before it blew, which was where this picture was took. Um, this actually has a, a side story to it. The, the two uh, were uh, climbing Mount St. Helens, at least exploring the uh, the crevasse uh, field area on the on the mountain, and uh, my grandfather dropped his tripod in this crevasse. This is his buddy Jerry looking for the tripod. They eventually uh, located it and retrieved it. Um, I don't have any documentation of that, but I'm sure that was an interesting um, rescue. Um, so this is uh, a common uh, uh, garb here for mountaineers in the 1930s. If you look closely at the feet, there's just two spikes with a leather strap wrapped around their feet. Um, they're using what was called an alpenstock uh, to, instead of, a, of an ice axe at that point, carrying hemp uh, uh, fiber ropes and just a few rations uh, and, and woolies in the backpack in case the weather turned. Um, go back to the additions here. Um, some more photographs as I scroll down here. Uh, he became a master at uh, exposures and, and, and figuring out what uh, uh, that chemical reaction that takes place in the dark room, mastering what all the timing that goes behind uh, developing your own pictures it, it, and is something that he did. Uh, I'm sure my mom could tell you when she was growing up that her father was always down in the dark room doing something. Mm -hmm. Was that, is that right? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and as a little girl, I was only about five or six years old. I would stand, probably wasn't real good for me at the time, but with all the chemicals on the <laughs> table. Yeah. And I was the one that was supposed to go like this to the photograph, you know, as it came into 
few, but he was always, always down there in the basement. Hundreds, thousands. Thousands, thousands of photographs. I wish you would go back to the umbrella tent and give the history behind that. Here, oh, yeah, that's right. That's no right. Class. Yeah. Where was that? Um, that was with your etching. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Is that going to take too long? No, no. no I, this is, this is the know? actual tent they had just packed away in that car. Um, there, I've got photographs of it uh, put up, uh, and, and uh, uh, it, it looks pretty much exactly like this. Um, but this is this is another drawing on what I did. There's oil paint on this, but this is this is the tent that they used. Can I say a little something? Mm -hmm. Of course, Mom always has to say something. Please. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents bought property over in Puget Sound when I was about four years old, and and there were no roads at the time. We came into the bay by a kicker boat. And um, we lived, my sister and I lived in that tent while my uh, father built a lean to out of uh, cedar shakes. Anyway, I lived in that in the summertime in that umbrella tent for years and years and years. My sister um, did not like the outdoors. I loved it. So I would sit in that tent and throw spiders at it. <laughs> she was older than I was, um, eight years, and all I can remember is how much fun I had laying on the cot, mm -hmm. grabbing spiders because I'm not afraid of insects, and throwing the big ones, which they have over their head. Mm -hmm. And my dad, <laughs> I would say, That's great. Christine, I don't stop that, but I, <laughs> I've got a, uh, quite a memory of that. So oh, I'm sure. <laughs> So yeah, good memories. So on this uh, site, I have posted some some of the photographs that have stood out to me as I've gone through this collection. Some of them are just really you know classic kind of uh, nature photography. Um, some of them are uh, a, a little more unique, like this piece, uh, this photograph here of my grandfather, grandmother in the car. Um, just to kind of wrap things up here. Uh, I'm going to go back to the blog. I recently, I'm not sure why I haven't done this before, um, but uh, I've recently tried to reach out to the family back in Sweden. In 1994, when I graduated high school, I went to Ostersen, Sweden to visit the remaining cousins from the family, the cousins that uh, were the same bloodline as my great-grandfather that came in here. In 1994, I met uh, some of his uh, brothers, sons, children, um, and they were quite elderly at the time, but just recently I made a long distance call to uh, a fellow named Goodman who put me up, scroll through all these carte de visite cards. Um, I, I called Goodman up, who was probably close to 100 years old. The first time I called him, I realized it was two in the morning in Sweden. <laughs> Nobody answered. Uh, the second time I called him, it was uh, it was kind of approaching afternoon. Nobody answered. Um, I got the phone number offline, some you know Google search or something like that. I didn't even know if it was the right phone number. But on the third phone call, he answered. Barely talk. So elderly, he could. He was just kind of gasping for breath almost. I couldn't figure out if he was, you know, on his last breath or not. But knowing Goodman, he was probably just out for a walk and just came back in the house. Anyway, I said, Goodman, this is your cousin from America. And it took him about a few minutes before he put the, he was able to string together what was going on. I was speaking English. Um, and, he, and, and the last words he said to me were, thank you, thank you. And I sent him a postcard uh, with the address here to, to the website, hoping that one of his children or something will help him find it. Because this is actually a wedding photograph here of, my uh, great-grandfather's brother, and I think this is his second marriage because it was taken in the 1920s. Um, family members all throughout here, this is Goodman right here, is, is a, probably a late, in his late teens. Shortly after this blog post, I found, and I, luckily I have a, a family tree, a gene, list of genealogy that goes back seven generations. So when I find a name, I can cross-reference it and see who that person is. This is Goodman's father, Eric Pearson, who was uh, 
uh, part of the family, and, I, and I'm drawing a blank about who. So I was able to make that connection because I knew Goodman's father was named Eric Pearson, and the only other Eric Pearson was my grandfather. So this must have been him. So I, hopefully Goodman can get to the, the website and find these old photographs. I, like I said, I don't know why I haven't done that before. I've just been too selfish to think about it, I suppose. Um, uh, that's really all I have. Uh, if there's any questions, please let me know or talk to me afterwards. Thanks. Oh yeah. I don't know if I'll ever be able to say I'm done. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah with I the research are you referring to? No, I mean, so, so many rich materials, you, yeah, you, mm -hmm. you have so many thinking flowing, and I think it needs to take at least two times to finish your, to share your... Oh, yeah, right, your, right. Your, yeah. Yeah. It's very wonderful. It's hard to squeeze it all in. <laughs> right. Any questions or comments from our listeners? <laughs> all right. Any questions about, yeah. the, like, the, the two of the... This, this picture, uh, how you decide to choose the, the tune of this picture? Like, the drawing, like, it's kind of like the, how to say, yeah, the composition? Yeah, the, the color of the drawing, it's, yeah. like, there's a tune, the pattern of the color, right? It's, it's, it's on wood. wood. It's, oh. it's on wood. Oh. So, the, the support that it's on is just natural wood grain. Oh, so all of the pictures, including those that you said you draw based on the pictures, photos, are all on the wood. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, the original photograph, see the wood grain thing? Mm -hmm. See the wood grain in the background? Oh. And then you just collect this wood? Yeah, yourself, I, or? I, this was an old bowling lane. In fact, I think it was the bowling lane they took out of. SCC. I wonder. Yeah. Oh, what is that? Um, the bowling lane that they took out of SCC. Like they used to have a bowling, like we did, oh. but they took the dismantled it. They took it away. Oh, and then. So you got some other wood from that. Oh. <laughs> did, did you need to buy it or? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I did. It, was, it wasn't as expensive as I thought it was going to be, but it was definitely a little bit of an investment. The librarians have questions. We're real worried about that. Yeah. Over your books. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you know, good eye. Good eye. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave that up there. Yeah. Yeah. We found that more disturbing than the other. I made that yeah, drawing after so I got my yeah. second. I made it, I drew that after I got my yeah. second yeah. notice. I was like, well, okay, the only way yeah. this is going to make sense is if. I see it in front of me, but then I know, I just marry you. Oh, just keep it. So maybe he's already done. This is not from the wood, right? No, this is just a joke. Yes. Yeah. 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 Me too. I was going to keep all that back. Hang on. I'll come in the library and tell kids, you know, you can't take out a book and you always do it. And I'm like, 